Hey, awesome. <laughs> I'm Brianna, and I'm going to be telling you a bit about my work within the quantum computing and AI field. But before I talk about myself, I first wanted to thank everybody at Viki for putting this event together and putting in lots of time and effort into organizing it. So I say we all give them a round of applause for doing this for us today. So when I was 14, I became really fascinated with this new type of computing called quantum computing. And quantum computing is this new type of computer that leverages quantum mechanics to solve really difficult problems that we've never been able to before. At the time, I would go to school, run all the way back home, and just spend all of my time reading about quantum computing. And I thought it was the field that I would spend the next decade of my life studying for so that I could work in this field when I was around 30 years old. A couple of weeks later, I was at the Knowledge Society, which is this human accelerator program that I'm a part of. And the Knowledge Society basically raises the next generation of Elon Musk by teaching us next generation knowledge and skills. So I was talking to one of my mentors at the Knowledge Society about what area of science or technology I want to spend a lot of my time working in or thinking about or learning about. And I thought, well, quantum computing is really fascinating. I would love to spend all my time learning about it, but I'm only 14. I mean, how could a 14-year-old possibly learn anything about quantum computing? I don't know linear algebra, I don't know calculus, I don't even know how to program. And so he looked at me and he said, Brianna, why don't you just try anyways? Why don't you just try to learn this new thing regardless of what you think you can and cannot do? And so I did. I spent the next couple of months learning about quantum circuits and quantum algorithms and how these quantum computers actually work. A couple of months later, I'm offered this opportunity to fly down to Berkeley, California from this company called Rigetti. And Rigetti is one of the world's leading quantum computing companies. So a couple of my friends and I, we fly down to Berkeley, California to then work with this team of quantum engineers on trying to accelerate the process of drug discovery using a quantum computer. <laughs> Fast forward a couple of months later after that, I'm talking to the CEO of Xanadu, which is the CEO of this company that creates these types of quantum computers. This is called a photonic quantum computer. And they work by manipulating photons or particles of light. So I'm talking to the CEO. We have five meetings that basically consist of me talking about how excited I am about quantum computing and all the things that I want to learn within this field. And after these five meetings, he offers me an internship to then work for that company on their software team. So then I spend the next two months building out documentation for their quantum simulator and also trying to get my hands dirty in the quantum machine learning field by building my own quantum machine learning models, which is really the intersection of quantum computing and AI. What you see here is that within a span of a year, I went from thinking that I could never learn a thing about quantum computing to then working for one of the world's leading quantum computing companies. So how did this happen? I'll be honest, I'm not some genius level nerd with an IQ of 160. My parents don't know a thing about science or technology, and my school has never taught me anything remotely related to quantum computing or even computing really. It all really happened when I had a shift in my mindset. I decided that something that I thought I couldn't do was then possible. And I was lucky enough to have a mentor at the Knowledge Society who pushed me to push the status quo and think about doing things that I thought were inconceivable. And this isn't a one-time scenario thing that just happened by coincidence. A year later, I got really interested in artificial intelligence, specifically two subsets of AI called natural language processing and deep learning. So I spent all my time reading research papers in this field and also trying to build up neural networks and other projects within AI. A couple of months later, I go to this conference in Toronto called Creative Destruction Lab. And I spot this guy named Jordi Rose. So Jordi Rose is the founder of D-Wave, one of the world's first quantum computing companies. So he's literally the, one of the pioneers of quantum computing. Also created another company called Kindred AI where he works on robotics and AI. 
and now has a company called Sanctuary Eye working on human intelligent robots. So I see Jody Rose at the end of the room, and I feel butterflies in my stomach. I start to get really nervous. I'm like, this guy is crazy smart. How could I possibly talk to him? But I end up mustering the courage to then approach him and start talking to him about, and start talking to him about some of the work that I've been learning about and what I want to do in, within quantum computing and AI. After that one conversation, fast forward a week later, we have a three hour call where we're talking about things ranging from happiness to the purpose of life and stoicism, meditation, the, the hedonic treadmill, all of these really deep, profound topics that most 16 year olds don't really know about. At the end of this conversation, I asked him about the possibility of working on a project with one of their AI teams. And he agrees, yes. So five months later, I fly out to Vancouver, where I'm working for this company called Sanctuary AI on building human intelligent robots. And this was one of my best friends. Her name's Nadine. Uh, <laughs> so we took a selfie together, and this is kind of what she looks like. But at Sanctuary AI, I was working on their cognitive mind architecture, which is a deep learning, reinforcement learning abstraction of how the human mind works. Specifically, I was building AI algorithms to solve some of their problems. Now, the one key lesson that I want you to take away from these stories is the fact that children are told what to do and what they can do and cannot do at a very young age. And this goes on into their teenage life and on to their adulthood. We're constantly being told what we can and cannot do. And there are constantly people who are potentially limiting our potential. Imagine a world where children didn't live with these confined limits of what they could and could not do. Imagine a world where children would just break down all the barriers that they have in their head and literally become limitless. Most of the time for this to happen, we generally need a mentor or a teacher to allow us to push ourselves to our limits and accomplish things that we've never been able to accomplish before. And I was fortunate to have these types of people in my life. Another interesting thing to note is that all of these things that I've talked about at Xanadu or at Sanctuary within quantum computing and AI, I didn't learn about them in school. Actually, when you look at the education system today, what I spend my time learning about is English and math and history and French. And all of these subjects are still important, but there's a disconnect between the future and what we're teaching our kids today. In fact, here's just a little sample of what the future will consist of. Advanced transportation, genetic engineering, artificial intelligence. All of these technologies will completely transform how some of our current industries work today. And what's absolutely crazy is that we spend very little time learning about these technologies in school today. Almost zero time. The, school, the schooling system and just education in general is in the past. What we need to do to prepare kids for the future is to teach them about quantum computing, to teach them about AI, to teach them about genetic engineering. And maybe then they'll be able to solve some of the world's most difficult problems. Because here's the reality. We have a lot of problems that we're facing in today's current world. Cancer is still a real problem. Global warming is still a real problem. Drug-resistant drug bacteria is now a real problem. And as it is today, I'm honestly not confident in my generation to be able to solve these really difficult problems in the next coming years, not to mention the even more difficult and complex problems that we're going to face as a humanity in the next decade. The only way that we're going to raise a generation of children who are prepared is to teach them about what the future will look like. It's to teach them about all of these uprising technologies and allow them to apply them to solving really difficult problems. That's how we're going to be prepared. Now, the last story that I want to tell you about is about one of my teachers that I met when I was 12 years old. His name was Mr. Mora. He's this old white guy with a beard, and he walks around with a walking cane. But he taught me what was honestly one of the most important skills I've ever learned in my life. It was the ability to think. And this is how he did it. He would take a question and put it, put it up on the board, or a, or a controversial statement, such as, the legal marijuana should be legalized. 
pretty controversial statement. And he would tell us, okay, go home and think about this statement. Do you believe in it or do you not? And have some rationale as to why you believe in that opinion. So I did that. I took the statement, did some research at home, read some articles, wrote down some notes, and developed what I thought was my own opinion. And I came to class the next day and told him about it. What he did was that he kept pressing me with questions, and questions, and more questions. He found loopholes in my thinking. And I didn't have any rebuttals for any of his arguments. At the end of this class, I realized that a lot of the opinions that I have about the world actually aren't mine. This opinion that I had about this issue was a regurgitated opinion of a bunch of other people online. And this is what most kids do today. Honestly, this is what a lot of adults do today. They take the opinions of others and try to make them their own without actually thinking about them. And so this ability to think about things, to take in information and use your own values, maybe your culture, rationale, logic, to take in this information and actually develop your own opinion is honestly one of the most important skills today. And yet, it's kind of mind-boggling that it's still not taught in schools. I was really fortunate to have, an, again, another mentor in my life, or another person in my life, who decided to push my thinking and to push how I currently saw the world. The education system is in the past. In fact, schools and how the education system works today were really created in the 1800s, and they were created to create factory workers. And what's absolutely insane is that these two photos, oh well, anyways, these two photos of a classroom and this classroom in the 1800s, they don't look that different. We haven't changed the education system that much. So this is what I think needs to happen. We need to create education 2.0. And it's going, to it's going to contain of three different parts. The first part is a complete shift in mentality. Kids need to be pushed to think 10x, 100x. Think of things that they've never been able to conceive of before. Because right now, we all have these limits in our head as to what we can and cannot do, or what we can and cannot think of. But in reality, we should actually be breaking down these limits and thinking about things that nobody else can think of today. If you even imagine anybody who has created anything significant in the world, they were always thinking in a very different way. And honestly, they were a bit crazy. And that's the only way that we're going to be able to solve some of these really difficult problems like cancer. It's if we think in a very different way, and we think without these limits and barriers that hinder our thinking. The second component of this is actually teaching kids next generation skills and knowledge. What will the future look like? The future will consist of really uprising technologies that will completely transform today's industries. And so there should be curriculums that talk about AI. There should be a curriculum that talks about genetic engineering and blockchain and cryptocurrency and quantum computing. Kids should be aware of what the future will look like because that is the world that they're going to live in in the next 20 years. I mean, we're trying to prepare kids for the next 50 years of their life, but we're still using a system that's almost 500 years outdated. And so the other important aspect of teaching kids what the future will look like is actually allowing them to apply this toolbox of technologies to really important problems. And one thing that I got to do in the program that I mentioned, the Knowledge Society, is to be able to actually have day-long hackathons where we'd be given a problem statement like, solve the housing crisis. And I'd have six hours to think about as many hypotheses, as many solutions and hypotheses as I could about how to solve the housing cross, how, how, as to how to solve the housing crisis using AI, for example. And so it's not only about developing all the foundational skills and knowledge to understand what the future will look like, it's about knowing how to utilize that to solve really important pressing problems that we're facing today and to solve the problems that we're gonna be facing in the next decade. The third part of this is to train thinking as a skill. Thinking is one of the most important skills that you'll ever be able to learn. And honestly, this is a skill that I'm still working on. If we want to create people who will be leading the next generation, how will, how will, we, how will we be able to create these people if they can't even think for themselves? 
that just doesn't make any sense. And so within the curriculum, I think we need to have frameworks for thinking that are taught. For example, first principles thinking. It's a framework that Elon Musk constantly uses to create his companies like Tesla. He actually used first principles thinking to create and design the new battery that Tesla uses. And it's basically by taking a very complex idea, bringing it down into, its, into every single component that it's made of, and actually thinking about solutions from looking at every single component that a problem is made of. That's a framework for thinking. And I think these types of frameworks for thinking should be taught in schools because this not only, apply, this not only applies to solving an issue like cancer, but it also applies to things within your personal life. Like, let's say you're, you have a fight with your girlfriend. You're going to apply first principles thinking to solve this problem with your girlfriend. These frameworks for thinking can be applied to every aspect of our life, and they're very important for us, and they're very, and they're very important for us to be taught today. This is what I think. I'm super excited to be a part of the next generation of people who will go on to solve some of these really difficult problems and be able to use and apply emerging technologies to do this. But I also can't do this alone. We're going to need an entire generation of young, ambitious, smart people to progress humanity forward together. Thank you. Wasn't that wonderful? Wow. And this is a 16-year-old talking. Wow. <laughs> to the audience, question and answers, please. And we have a lot of kids. Yes, right at the back. Uh, can we have people with mics in the audience, please? <coughs> While we get the mic to the young boy at the back, I want to ask you, Brianna. So, I was talking to Brianna a little bit before she started her session, and she told me she's uh, starting this, uh, she's trying to invent this artificial intelligence computer, quantum computer that can basically, she likes to do a lot of research. But a lot of the kids may not like to read those 12 hours of arduous big pages of research. So she's actually trying to develop something that you can put the 12 hours of documents into this quantum computer. It will dumb it down take it down to a layman's level, and give it to you in one or two pages, and then you can read it. And she's inventing something like that. So Brianna, you want to tell us something about that? Yeah, for sure. So right now, I'm working with a friend on basically creating a product that we really want. And that's the entire premise, like create something that you want. You might have heard this from Y Combinator, which is a startup accelerator. Um, and right now, so for me, I, I spend a lot of time reading research papers. And it's not that fun when you don't fully understand all the jargon that goes into research papers. I'd spend at least six hours just reading one research paper to fully understand what it means. So I was talking to my friend about this problem and how we basically face it on a daily basis. And we're like, OK, maybe we can try to build something to help us solve this problem. So within AI, there's a subset, there's a subfield of AI called natural language processing that kind of deals with the understanding of text, generation of text. Um, and so. Specifically, what we're working on is creating uh, a stack of AI algorithms that will then work together to, you can take in as input some research paper that's a text file, and you can output some really nice um, summary of what that research paper actually means in pretty layman's terms. So we're using two models here. One, in, one is just an extractive model, which actually looks at the research paper, finds all the important components, and, out, and outputs that into another text file. The other part of the model is an abstractive model, which then understands what the research paper is actually talking about and tries to craft a summary around all the important parts of that research paper. And so what you see as the output is that we could take a research paper that might have taken you 12 or 6 hours to actually understand, and hopefully you can read this document on a web page that will take maybe 10 minutes to understand. So right now, I'm coding the model with my friend, and we're trying to figure out how this thing's actually going to work. But it's pretty exciting. Can it give exams for you? Pardon? Can it give exams for you? Maybe. I'll think about that feature. I'm not joking. Yes, at the back. Uh, good evening. I'm Sudhan Kapil Hi. from Pathways World School at RW. So people often question artificial intelligence replacing many jobs, with the common answer being a structural shift in the economy towards a more IT-focused uh, economy. Mm -hmm. That's what leads to my question. Uh, in a, my question about AI, uh, learning, and the economy. So in an eco uh, in a pop in the, with a population of 1.5 billion people, 
Um, how do you plan to accommodate uh, the changes you just talked about in the curriculum and in learning? All the way from kids to mature adults, from tier 1 cities to even tier 3 cities. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, for sure. Like This is a problem that we're going to be facing in the next decade. Um, I was actually reading this article by Brian Johnson, and he's the CEO of Kernel, which is this brain-computer interface company. They literally take brain chips and they're trying to put them in our brains to then make us more intelligent or allow us to do brain-to-brain -brain communication, for example. Um, and his thoughts on this, which I, I think I, I agree with right now, is that like, if we don't start actually advancing ourselves and expanding our own human intelligence, like, we're just going to become irrelevant. Um, and that's kind of a scary thing to think about, that us humans, we're going to become economically irrelevant because of how intelligent our machines will eventually get. Um, and so what that really means for us is that we're just going to need to adapt. So one thing that I'm really interested in, and this is what I'm looking at currently, is like, how do we expand our species intelligence? And I really think that there's two domains of technologies that will allow us to do this. One, brain-computer interfaces, which is what I talked about, putting brain chips in our brain, hopefully not invasively, um, and allowing us to just become a more intelligent species, whether that's through language or through in enhanced cognitive functions. That's one way of going about it. The second way is creating a machine, a machine intelligence. So creating machines that are intelligent enough that will enable us to like accelerate what we can currently do. So having it as like a symbiotic relationship between a machine where we can both work together and rely on each other to just become a more intelligent species. And so like I just think it's a reality that AI is just going to get smarter and smarter. And so us as a species, we're going to have to adapt to that. We can't just ignore a problem and allow, like, for example, a country like China to develop really super intelligent AI in their basement. We're going to need to adapt as a species. That's my thoughts on it. Yes, please. Yes, sir. My name is Ashwini Gupta. So you're Mike. My name is Ashwini Gupta. I'm a retired bank officer, currently marketing wealth management products and insurance. My question is, uh, isn't there a risk that somebody might copy your ideas and uh, deprive you of recognition? Do you have plans to apply for a patent? <laughs> um, that's totally possible, but if that's the case, then I'm totally down to talk to that person and work on a solution together. That sounds great. Uh, I'll recruit people if you can program. <laughs> yes, yes, ma'am. Um, good evening, I'm Sonu Rawat, Vice Principal at Interprom Public School. Mm -hmm. My question to you, Brianna, is that uh, you talked about the brain chips. And uh, it seems to me, as a person who's in, uh, in early 50, that probably down the line, within a decade or so, we, are we in the process of creating the sections of humans where certain humans with those brain chips would be super intelligent? Certain human with certain brain chips would be more into a different kind of work zone where we will not be able to hide anything from the big boss, something like that. Um, so the technology that I talked about, brain-computer interfaces, it is, is in its like earliest, earliest stages right now. Um, even human trials, there have been like very, very few. And of those human trials, this technology doesn't work very well. So it's really a problem that we're going to be thinking about in the next couple of decades. Honestly, I'm not an expert in this area either, but I do know that it's just very, very early stage. And so these are some of the questions that companies like Neuralink, uh, Kernel, Control Labs, all these companies they are talking about it right now because they are scared that there will be a huge kind of intelligence divide between people. But how I see, how I see just humanity in general is that everybody can add their own type of value. Whether you're a musician, you can add a different type of value than a computer programmer can add, right? Um, and all these types of values are very integral to like, how we function as a society. And so it's going to take a very long time for certain jobs and certain people to become irrelevant. And I don't think it's something that we have to necessarily worry about in, in, like, right now in this moment just because that, that, that technology in particular is so far off. Um, but it's definitely something that I think a lot of experts are thinking about right now. Yeah. Wonderful. Yes, Vinesh, please. Brianna, hi. hi. Uh, my name is Vinesh Menon. I represent the Vibgyo Group. I'm in my mid-40s, so it's absolutely fascinating that I'm going to be mm -hmm. asking you this question. Um, but tell me, with, with all the stuff that you spoke about, which is fascinating, schooling in India has always got us this little connect with emotional quotient, EQ. Mm. Okay, And with what you're saying going mm -hmm. forward, do you see EQ getting diluted out? Because eventually what's going to happen probably with what you're saying is 
a lot of reduction in this whole emotional connect between people. Mm -hmm. And do you see that as a danger? Um, so I think the human connection is something that's honestly irreplaceable. Like, the feelings and emotions that you get from just talking to somebody and seeing a person face to face is very, very hard to replicate. And maybe the only way that we'll ever be able to replicate that is by creating a human intelligent robot that is like realistic to the point where it passes a Turing test, but not even a Turing test, like something far advanced than the Turing test. And I think those types of robots are honestly quite far off. Um, so in general, like my personal opinion on this is that because this human connection is honestly irreplaceable, like it's very, very difficult to replicate it and find something that's just like it. It's something that's going to exist for a very long time until we have something like a brain computer interface where I don't actually need to be talking to you. I can just be looking at you and you'll just kind of like get my thoughts. Um, and maybe um, what I think is going to happen is there's, there's going to be an evolution in language and how we interact with each other, which will be very interesting. Um, but regardless, like, we are social creatures and we kind of need each other to function and thrive. And so it's not something that I ever see not existing. Prabhat, please. Hi, Brianna. My name is Prabhat Jain. And, you know, uh, initial moments I was just wondering what I was like when I was 16, 14, right? So I think the world has changed and I belong to two or three generations uh, before you, not, not just the last generation. You look young. <laughs> Thanks for that. Only with the receding hairline. So, you know, Mike, uh, you know, I, I was thinking, so what, what we are doing essentially now is that we humans who have traditionally been intelligent, mm -hmm. we are creating machines and then we are competing with them, mm -hmm. right? And that's exactly what we are doing, you know. That's what I think one of the first questions was with the jobs and everything and we becoming more smarter than the machine because you have to compete with the machine. Mm -hmm. So while all that is fine, so in a way we are creating our own destruction, in a, you know, so to say, or maybe evolution of a human uh, a being to, to become even uh, more intelligent. But in this whole process, which is exciting, which is stimulating, there is one more thing which is important, which I think the world is forgetting a little bit, is how to remain happy. Mm. So do you see that also as a problem? Mm. And maybe at some point of time, would you and smart kids like you, like, you know, your friends would, would work on that problem to, to, to tell all of us that how to remain happy? Yeah, for sure. So this is something that I really wanted to include in my presentation. Just the fact that in school we don't talk about happiness and yet we kind of argue that like the reason that we all live is to remain happy but this term happy isn't defined really by anybody and so there's a couple of other terms that people say such as like eudaimonia which is like a feeling of fulfillment um, or happiness being a very temporary emotion that you feel at a certain time step in, in, in time um, and so this is something that I think really goes back to education and how happiness should be talked about. Right? And it's a very important, like, first of all, I think it's a subjective thing to define for yourself. It's very dependent on how you feel and perceive the world. For example, for me, um, there's something called the hedonistic treadmill, where basically most people, they stay at a general, like, a general mood that doesn't have a lot of variance. And I think I kind of relate to that more, whereas some of my friends who experience emotions a lot differently from me, their emotions are kind of like this, where they feel a lot of emotions from different things. And so from those two perspectives, we'll perceive and understand and define happiness in two very different ways. So my main point being is that happiness is something that we should be talking about in schools. And honestly, the term happiness, like this word itself, is probably not even the correct word for the feeling that we get of like fulfillment or whatever that is in your life. Um, it's something that needs to be talked a lot more. And there needs to be a lot more debate and thought about it. And a huge part of this is just self-awareness in general, which I think, again, a lot of kids lack, a lot of adults honestly lack too. Like the ability to like be aware of your own emotions and be honest with your feelings with yourself and also be able to introspect and retrospect on how you feel. That's another thing that I would have loved to tie into this presentation. Like we should talk about self-awareness a lot more and we should train self-awareness as a skill. And it's also a very subjective skill. And I think it ties very nicely into happiness because if you're not self-aware, you don't really know how you're feeling. Um, so yeah, these are two things that should be talked a lot more within education. And it's, it's something that, like, honestly, kids should be thinking about as young as, like, grade two. Because we all feel emotions. Like, a grade two kid can get angry, they can feel happy, and yet we don't have really good ways of quantifying these emotions yet. So I totally agree. Like, it's something that we need to spend a lot more time thinking about and talking about. It especially connects into neuroscience because we don't fully understand the brain. We understand a very limited number of things about the brain and so another area that this will connect into is just like a lot of neuroscientists doing lots of research into like 
what happiness is and like what fulfillment are within the brain and in that context. Yeah, there was an interesting study done that actually asked people if you had to rank yourself in a scale of 0 to 10 on how happy you are, the average answer across age groups, across countries was 7. And then they asked, fine, if you're a 7 on 10 in terms of how happy you are, what do you need to do to make that 7 into 10 on 10? And then most people said things like, oh, you know, I should be richer, or I should get more sleep, or I wish the person I love loved me back, those kind of things. And when they tried to achieve that, and they did achieve it, and then you ask them, okay, now what is your happiness? It was still the same. It wasn't like you were going up the ladder. So the question is, again, how do you define and quantify that happiness? And is it a treadmill that you're always on, just trying to seek something more? Um, Shobha, would you like to ask? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Hi, Brianna. Uh, you know, it's amazing to hear you talk because uh, obviously you are an extremely matured girl, you know, for, a, for your age. You talked about thinking as a skill and you said that, you know, it should be taught in uh, schools. So we have a lot of kids over here from school. Uh, I want you to highlight, you know, how did you develop that thinking skill? Because in the age where uh, kids are always clued on to, you know, their mobile apps and phones and television and internet, I don't think, you know, much uh, thinking goes in over there and they're just consuming data that is being uh, thrown at them. So if you could just throw a little bit of light as to what should they do to change that habit of theirs. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think the first lens of this is just self-awareness in general. Like, if you're aware of how you feel and if you're aware of like how you spend your time and how you act with other people, you just have this level of awareness on yourself, which I kind of think is like an added level of just like to yourself. Like, like for example, how I see it is that like for myself personally, like there's always like another eye that's watching me. And this eye, I get all the data that this eye is constantly taking in, which is how I'm talking to you right now and how I know that my body language looks like, looks like right now. Like that's all forms of self-awareness. So the first part, like really being able to think about anything is just being aware of yourself, like know thyself, which a lot of you have probably heard about. Um, the second part of this, um, and this might, this will vary depending on like your cultural background and who your parents are. Um, and again, how you perceive the world and your emotions. But it's about like breaking down, once again, like these barriers that you have in your head. Um, I, I actually like this idea. It's, it's called intellectual freedom. Um, and the moment that I learned about it, I learned about this, I learned about it from this movie called The Matrix. I imagine a lot of you have heard about it, which is basically where like um, this guy, he's trapped in this world that is separated from another world, which is reality, I guess. And this distorted world that he's trapped in, everybody's kind of stuck in the matrix. And so they all lack intellectual freedom. Um, and the people who are in this real world, they have intellectual freedom, I suppose. And the only way that they have this form of intellectual freedom is by kind of breaking down all of the, like, one, using self-awareness to understand their own biases and their prejudice against everybody and towards themselves. Um, but also just, like, being able and, like, en enabling yourself to question everything that's around you. And just to tie this back into my personal experience, um, living in Canada, like people are very open to new ideas and thoughts. And I'm very grateful to live in Canada and have people who are very open to these new ideas and thoughts because that allows you to gain this intellectual freedom. Basic, like how I like to put it is that like you are a plant that is rooted in some soil. And to really be able to question things in a new type of way is you probably need to take your roots out of that soil. For example, my family is Hindu, and so I used to go to the temple, and I was taught all of these religious values, which are perfectly fair, not against them in any way, but I need to be able to look at the world in a different way, which is removing myself from this religion and allowing myself to just see things as how they are. And so, again, going back to self-awareness, it's about being aware of all your biases and being aware of yourself. So I think those are the first two steps that anybody has to do. One, becoming self-aware of yourself and your own biases and how you think about the world. And two, once you are, so, once you are self-aware of your own biases and how you think about the world, then allowing yourself to question things as they are. Um, another controversial thing that I thought about a lot as a child was the idea of there being a god or some higher being. And that's something that I just thought about a lot and questioned, and I allowed myself to be okay with 
going to any, any type of answer or any conclusion that I went to at the time. And so this openness to new ideas is also very important. I think those are the two main steps that I tell children to think about now. Yeah. Wonderful. Yes, Vedant, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Brianna. I'm Vedant Katan. Um, so you spoke about uh, you know, very deep technology, quantum computing, replacing human tasks from what I understand, if I understand you correctly, a lot of the problems, whether it's scientific problems or medical problems like cancer like you spoke about, or uh, uh, the ability to perform specific tasks faster like the program you're developing, right? My concern is about uh, you know, human evolution that has gone uh, uh, in the fields of art, culture, music, dance, performance, which has been the cornerstone of any civilization, right? Um, so what are your thoughts on that of technology replacing human beings? I know that a robot even today can probably paint a picture. Mm -hmm. Is that the same as a human painting it? Is the perception of another human going to be the same as that if, if a robot paints that picture? And how important are all these fields as human beings evolve over the next 10, 20, 30 years? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I just want to narrow down your question more. Um, so you're asking me, is it possible for a human to paint another human? Like, is it possible to, like, replicate the human, like... No, no. My question is that the fact that... My question, to be more clear, is that robots can replace a lot of what humans can do in the yeah. future, right? Things like art, culture, music, mm -hmm. performance, right? Which is a very human-to-human -human connect today, mm -hmm. right? Tomorrow, perhaps a robot may be able to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, do you feel that? Do you feel that that's still an integral part of being human, and that is, a, a, you know, that is a value that needs to be retained? And even if a computer can do that, it's not really something that can replace a human being, or is it? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Is it, that's a question in my mind. Oh, I see. Yeah. So this is a very subjective question, to be honest, um, regarding like art and music and all these um, types of things. Like, I think it's very dependent on how you emotionally connect to like something like art or music. For example, like there are AIs that can write classical music today. Um, and me personally, if I'm listening to an AI that can write classical music, first of all, the AIs that can do this are not very good at doing it today, but I imagine that they'll get better in the future. But for me, this emotional connection that I have with music will probably be the same um, regardless of if it's an AI that wrote it or if it's a human that wrote it. Whereas somebody else who thinks in, this com thinks in a completely different way and like really wants to feel like the human aspect of music might have a completely different perspective from me. And they'll think, you know what, I, I don't think AI can write any type of music that is music. Like I think it needs to be written by a human. So this is a very subjective question. I personally think that like uh, music is really just a, a lot of notes put together in some way that sounds interesting or, or good to me. And I think a lot of different people or things can actually do that. And so I'm perfectly open to the idea of a machine being able to do that for me, um, if it can do that. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, Brianna. Uh, my name is Amit. I represent a company called Stones to Milestones. Uh, first of all, congratulations on your journey. I think it's been terrific. Uh, I think one of the uh, you know, things I picked up from your uh, sharing was uh, your self-learning and reading. Mm -hmm. I think you must have done a lot of reading yourself to you know, teach yourself all the skills. You know, as you said, you were not taught these skills in schools. How important do you think reading you know, is a skill for children? Because a lot of times we take that as a granted. And I'm not talking of literacy, I'm talking of reading with comprehension and understanding. Mm -hmm. how, how important has it been in your journey? Yeah, reading is crazy important. Um, thankfully, I just really enjoy reading a bunch of different things, whether that be on Reddit, on random subreddits, or whether that be from a really long book. Um, and so, first of all, the ability and skill to process information really fast and like understand it is incredibly important because we live in a knowledge-based society, or knowledge-based economy, rather. Like, you need to be able to understand knowledge really quickly. Um, and so this ability to read is crazy important. Like, I, I totally agree with you, um, especially for books. I think there's a lot of knowledge that um, my generation, or like, honestly, sometimes me, like, I take for granted that are within books. Like, I remember one time I walked into a library in Toronto, and I was like, Wow, imagine if I spent like a week just in this library, like reading a bunch of books. Like, imagine how much more of a knowledgeable person I would be after that week of reading. Um, and so this is something that we definitely take for granted. And I think a lot of kids really need to understand the importance of reading today. Because it's like, like right now we get it in the form of English class where you're kind of forced to read things that you don't really want to read. 
But there's something like really beautiful about just having an innate curiosity for something and allowing yourself to learn and ask a bunch of questions and go down a bunch of rabbit holes of like reading about things that you're interested in. So it's something that I hope uh, schools emphasize more in the future. Wonderful. Yes, one um, uh, Excuse me. Oh, yes, some, yes, in the yes. back, okay, sorry, there's a girl at the back, can we have her before you, Monica, uh, Hi, uh, hi, I'm Mishti from Nehru World School. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for motivating me. Um, I was really inspired by your words. Uh, my question to you is, do you think that artificial intelligence and quantum computing should be combined together uh, with class classroom learning? And are you really looking forward uh, for something related to it? Um, so by classical learning, I imagine you mean classical computing, like normal computers? Uh, but uh, like uh, you talked about the latest thing that uh, like students should now be known to, mm -hmm. such as genetic engineering, uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, at, at that level, uh, do you want artificial intelligence and quantum computing uh, combined uh, with uh, our normal classroom so that we have a better knowledge for future? Yeah, for sure. So this is something that I talked about as well. Um, first of all, quantum computing and AI are already being combined to create this new field called quantum machine learning. Um, and machine learning is just a subset of AI, or honestly, completely unrelated in a way. Um, so quantum machine learning is already a thing that exists. And I think it's just a matter of people our age being more exposed to these technologies and the fact that they do exist. Like the fact that you could become a quantum computing engineer or a quantum machine learning engineer. Like nobody is told about this. In fact, I had no clue that a quantum computer even existed two years ago. Um, but it's this new domain of like fields and jobs that exist that I think like people our age would become super excited about and start and like they would literally become the pioneers of the field just because quantum machine learning is such a new field. And so it's something that I think in high school, probably in science class or even a CS class, this should be talked about because it is the future. Like these things are going to happen in the next two decades or so. And so we're the ones who have to actually be the pioneers of the field. Like we're gonna determine whether um, quantum machine learning will become something useful or whether it's just gonna die down into uselessness. Um, and so it's like kind of our responsibility, but it's also the responsibility of people who actually create the curriculums in school. Um, and yeah, so now you know about quantum machine learning, so you should go home and read about quantum machine learning. <laughs> okay. Ah. Hmm. Hmm. Um, so here's the thing, quantum computing is used to solve like incredibly computationally difficult problems. Um, and just with respect to the classroom, I don't think there's much of an application to use quantum computing. AI for sure though, for example, we can create like personalized education systems where um, let's say you're playing a game and this game starts to learn how bad you are at math compared to how bad you are at reading comprehension. You can use AI to create personalized education, but I don't think quantum computing has much of an application here just because of the real application of this technology. It doesn't make any sense to use it. You'd just be wasting a lot of resources. Yeah. Excuse me, I have a question. Oh. Mm -hmm. Hello, I'm Navya from Nervous School. Hi. Uh, my question is, uh, will artificial intelligence overpower humans or will it act as a helping uh, hand in the busy world? In the busy world or business world? Business, like, like business. in this chaos, like everyone running me or something. So will it help or it will overpower in jobs and opportunities of humans? Like will it really help or it will overpower them? So this isn't a defined answer. Like we don't know yet because AI is kind of in its early stages. It can do certain things, but it's only good at doing those certain things. And so I'd say it's, like, it's really up to us, like literally me and like all of you guys as to whether we allow AI to like overpow overpower humans, we need to define what that means. Overpower humans or allow it to be a technology that helps us do, that helps us like solve really difficult problems. Like it's really up to us um, as to how much control and power we kind of give it um, as to, and as to how much we develop this field of technology. And so there is no conclusive answer. It's just what do we want the future to look like? Yes, Manit, please. Hello, uh, I'm Arunati Aswal from Jiri Gunko World School. Ooh, I like that. 
Uh, thank you for inspiring all of us here. Um, so my question is like, what? Uh, how do you like you know? Can how when can we expect the quantum computing to be in our houses or school? Yeah, so uh, it, it actually doesn't make sense for quantum computers to be in our houses just because um, they're really, really expensive and they take insane amounts of electricity. And so if we were to use quantum computing in any way, for example, like if I wanted to use a quantum computer, I would access it through the cloud. And so that's what people are currently doing. You can actually access, like if you were to go on your laptop right now, you can run programs on a quantum computer from your laptop and send them to a real quantum computer at IBM or Microsoft, for example. So we're never going to have quantum computers in our house or even in our cell phones. That doesn't make much sense. We're going to have them as something that you can access through the cloud and use if you want to. What about schools? At schools? Um, maybe graduate and university schools that they're solving like really difficult math problems. Who knows? Maybe in the next like two decades, um, people in middle school become like these crazy math uh, quantum mechanics nerds, and they end up actually understanding how to use quantum computers in useful ways, possibly, but I kind of doubt it. Maybe, like, in higher education, yeah. Uh, actually, my question was, when can we expect? Oh, when can we expect? Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is a hard problem. This is, like, a hard question to answer, even for me. I'm not currently working in the field. I used to work with quantum computers a, a year ago or so, um, and so, just a rough estimate, I'd say in the next two decades or a decade. Um, so there's something called quantum supremacy, which is honestly a pretty vague subjective term that a lot of people haven't defined yet. So Google, they actually said that they, they, said that they reached quantum supremacy, but there's a lot of debate as to whether they did or not. And quantum supremacy is kind of like when quantum computers will actually be useful for us to use. So there's some really hard computation that we want to make. And it actually makes sense for us to use a quantum computer to do it because it does it a lot faster than our normal computers do. Um, so rough estimate, I'd say in the next two decades or so. But if you're really interested, I recommend checking out a paper that Google published about quantum supremacy that they reached, which currently has a lot of debate. But yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I hate to be the party spoiler. I know there's so many more questions and hands going up. I'm not one of those news anchors who wants to shut the show, but we do have a dignitary joining us, a very, very uh, important person. Uh, I want to thank Brianna. It was absolutely engaging. We had everyone engaged with what you had to say. I think the line of her entire talk, she said so many things, but the line that stood out for me was, she's a 16-year-old, and she says, no, no, I don't do that anymore. I stopped doing that last year. Wow. So thank you to Brianna. Round of applause for Brianna, please. Thank you.